The Sheriff contains graphic descriptions of violence, and in several episodes, sexual assault. It may not be suitable for all listeners. Hi, I'm Tony Adami, and this is The Sheriff, a new podcast series from the Northwest Florida Daily News and the Gannett Company. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever else you might get your podcasts from. The wheels of justice in Okaloosa County have a tendency to turn very slowly. Previously on The Sheriff. He and another man named Charlie Powell approached the car where a guy who had been kicked out as either sheriff or deputy sheriff shot them through the window. They were just kidding around, and he he shot them both, but only Murray died. Does either one of you remember a family, uh, the Casins? Yep. Can you tell me about the Casins? Well, they've been around here for years. Yeah. The Casin family had. One of them ran a liquor store past Mar Camp down there. Raymond, that was one brother. Yeah. Doyle was another brother. Mm-hmm. And Jess was another brother. What about Jess? Jesse. Jesse? Yeah. Uh, Episode 4 Maddie Lee. In July of 1958, the arrest of three Crestview men for the murder of Lester Wilson in 1940 sent shockwaves to the community. Lester, a former chief of police in Crestview, had been the leading candidate for sheriff in Okaloosa County when he was murdered. Within days, the arrests were a national story, and for good reason. That was because one of the men behind the investigation that led to the arrest was the son of Lester Wilson, Ray Wilson, the Okaloosa County Sheriff. In the 18 months leading up to the arrest, Ray had investigated the case with Pensacola Police Department investigator Walter Steinsick. Steinsick already had a reputation for solving cases nobody else could get to, and this just furthered that. In the Pensacola News Journal, the headline after the arrest ran top stripped across the front page, two decks. It read, Three Okaloosans indicted an 18-year-old murder. It's what we call in the newspaper industry the quote-unquote going-to-war headline treatment. What wasn't looked into that much at that time were who the men were that were arrested. It just gave brief descriptions in most of the articles. Jesse Kaysen, 56 years old, was a local liquor store owner and former justice of the peace in Crestview. Jesse's younger brother, Doyle, 51, was a local produce vendor. William Doris Brown, 49, whom went by Doris, was a civilian employee at nearby Eglin Air Force Base. All three men were held in the Panama City Jail after the arrest. Doyle and Doris both submitted to lie detector tests administered by Walter Steinsick immediately. Jesse, citing failing health, was not submitted to the test. Both Doyle and Doris failed. On August 7th, Senior Circuit Judge D. Stuart Gillis set November 10th for the trial date. He denied a motion by Farron Campbell, the attorney for Doris Brown, to have his client's trial moved to a separate date from the Casins. It was the first salvo in Campbell's strategy to distance his client from the Casins, who were represented by local attorney Thomas Beasley. Campbell was a well-respected attorney in the community who had actually served as Okaloosa County Sheriff for several months in 1950. That was before Governor Fuller Warren removed him from office after he found out that Campbell, who had replaced Sheriff H. I. Enzer, was actually Enzer's son-in-law. When it came to Warren's attention that Campbell was related to Enzer, he'd replaced him with Alty MacArthur, an engineer for the State Roads Department and the son of former Chief Sheriff's Deputy J. MacArthur, also the older brother of Murray MacArthur, who'd been shot to death by Lester Wilson, Ray's father, outside of a bar in Crestview in 1939. On August 9th, Judge Irwin Fleet announced that he'd been selected by Gillis to preside over the trial. He subsequently named Escambia County Sheriff Emmett Shelby as a special leaseor, or substitute sheriff, for anything to do with the trial. This was at Ray's request, to avoid a conflict of interest. Shelby was then ordered to pick five deputy leasors, guys who had worked the trial with him and were from Pensacola as well. As far as defense attorneys go, Farron Campbell and Thomas Beasley were about as good as you can get in the area. They were looked at as pretty formidable opponents by the state, and they didn't want to mess around. They brought in kind of their own stars in the legal scene to prosecute the case. The first move was by Governor Leroy Collins to replace State Attorney Ed Wick out of Pensacola, with famed attorney William Hallows III, who worked out of Jacksonville in Duval County. Wick had fumbled the filing of the indictment right away and caused some problems in the case. In the indictment, it accused the three men of simply killing Lester Wilson, quote, with a shotgun, when, in fact, it should have been more specific about each man's suspected role in the murder. In this case, the prosecution would assert that Jesse Kaysen had pulled the trigger, while Doyle and Doris had been involved in the planning and the act itself. Hallows admitted that he was concerned by the indictment's wording, in that with a shotgun did not specifically add by shooting him with a shotgun, 
which would have been the proper legal terminology that should have been used in the indictment. Wick also had flubbed in the simplest part of the document, the names of those accused of the crimes. Doyle Kaysen and William Doris Brown both had unique enough names that there was no confusion in the indictment. That was who they were. The problem was with Jesse James Kaysen, who was actually Jesse James Kaysen Jr., and his father was Jesse James Kaysen Sr. Now, Beasley quickly pointed out that the indictment just read Jesse James Kaysen, so there really wasn't a way to distinguish between if it was supposed to be the father or the son that was being arrested. Fleet threw that out pretty quickly and shot it down, but there probably was a legal precedent there, and Beasley would bring it up again in the trial. On November 5th, the defense was granted a continuation, and the trial's start date was moved back to November 17th. Hallows, who was traveling back and forth from Jacksonville for the case, wouldn't be alone in trying to prosecute the trio. He had assistant state attorney Gillis Powell. He had Forsyth Buddy Caro, one of the more famed attorneys to ever come out of Northwest Florida. Caro had actually been handpicked by Ray Wilson for the trial. Judge Fleet established a pretty strict precedent early on to keep the trial from getting out of hand. He knew it was already getting sensationalized in the press, so he ordered that no photos could be taken of anyone to do with the trial, either in the courtroom, anywhere in the courthouse, or even on the courthouse lawn. Ray, now divested of his role as sheriff for the trial at least, was able to turn his attention to more pressing matters, mainly the death threats that were beginning to come in against the lives of his family, and of the most concern to Ray and his wife Virginia were the threats against their four-year-old son, Stuart. Stuart still lives in Laurel Hill with his wife Barbara. Stuart has been a big help in telling his story because he's done such a good job of keeping the Wilson family history intact over the years. Well, I do remember that I, w- I was under protective custody during the trial. Really? Yeah. Uh, tell me about that. I'm like five, four or five years old, yeah. But I was under protective custody. I was hidden out in Orlando. Really? Yeah. Was it you? Because there was a threat. Dad told me years later the reason you would sent you down there during the whole trial was because we had received that there might be threats on the family. And I didn't really know that. No, I, I asked years later, Daddy told me we, we had to because there was a threat. Against, against the child and the family? The firstborn son. Wow. Jeez. I think the fact that a four-year-old's life was threatened shows you the kind of people that Ray Wilson was dealing with in trying to find justice for his father's murder. Lawyers from both sides spent three days picking the jury, touching on a variety of topics, mainly if they knew or had spoken with any of the defendants about the murder, what they knew about the 1939 killing of Murray MacArthur, and that it might be brought up in the trial. They also were asked a lot about their views on capital punishment. After two days, both sides had agreed on 12 jurors, including two alternates. It was notable in the press because there was one woman. She was the first woman ever to sit on a murder trial in Okusa County, and just the third woman to ever even sit in on a jury in Okusa County. On November 19th, the case started in earnest before a packed courtroom. Fleet had only allowed seating in the upper balcony of the courtroom during jury selection, but allowed the entire courtroom to be filled with spectators during the trial itself. The opening statements from the prosecution, given by Assistant State Attorney Gillis Powell, was pretty to the point. Through a pattern of fear and intimidation, the defendants had suppressed those who may have been able to uncover their guilt over the years. That the case was now only coming to light was more of a result of their guilty conscience and the fact that those who did have key information now, finally, felt safe to tell the truth after almost 20 years. They also disclosed, in public for the first time, that they believed it was Jesse Kaysen who had pulled the trigger and killed Lester Wilson. The defense argument was that the prosecution witnesses couldn't be believed, 25 in all. The defense attorney said that all the witnesses had either not told the truth in the 1940 or 1952 grand juries, and after all this time, their memories were impeachable. In particular, the defense attorneys went out of their way to single out one witness, a surprise witness that Walter and Ray had tracked down in Texas. Back in October, I sent a public records request to Okaloosa County trying to find any sort of information on this trial or these arrests. And there was no record of the trial transcript, there was no record of any arrests, All that stuff had kind of gone in the wind over the years. Now, someone, and I'm not sure exactly how this happened, learned that I was working on a story about Lester Wilson's murder and Ray Wilson as sheriff. At some point, I was approached by a third party who told me that they knew where there was a copy of the trial transcript and that if I wanted it, I could go to a certain place to get it. And when I was done with it, I would contact this third party again and tell them to come pick the transcript up from me. And that's what I did. It was 900 pages. And it was written on onion paper, which is a really thin paper that they don't use anymore. It's hand-typed, and it's a pretty unique document, uh, kind of unlike any I'd ever seen. What I found out when I was reading through this transcript was that there was a lot of stuff in the trial that didn't make it to the newspapers. I think a big reason for that was because of the formality of the time. You couldn't talk about a lot of stuff in public that you can now. 
I had the transcript for long enough that I was able to take pretty detailed notes and go through it a few times. The first time, I just kind of took count of, you know, who was testifying for what side and some of the key things they said. I went back through after that and actually took a word-for-word manuscript, essentially, typed up on my own, just looking at it, typing on the computer, of different witnesses and key parts of the trial that I wanted to have read by my coworkers. My hope was that this would create more of a live effect for us to bring us kind of into the moment. The prosecution presented their case first. Their first three witnesses were all from the Wilson family. Bama Wilson, Lester's widow, and his two sons, Woodrow and Alma Wilson. Much of Bama's testimony was perfunctory. She established how long the Wilsons had been living in Crestview, that Lester had been chief of police in Crestview for three years, that he'd lost sheriff's elections in 1932 and 1936. She was asked to establish the setup of the family's home at 748 Long Drive, where the murder occurred, specifically the front door, which was wood on the bottom and had four glass panels up top, so you could see into the home from the front porch. She established that only two of the couple's six children, 16-year-old Velma and 12-year-old Ray, were in the home at the time of the murder, as well as her father. Bama said Lester came home from work at the family's taxi business at approximately 8 p.m. and was listening to the radio in a chair positioned directly in front of the front door when the attack occurred. William Howells III took the lead in presenting the state's case to the jury, and you'll hear my voice substituted for uh, Mr. Howells. Here's Bama Wilson testifying at the trial in 1958. Well, I heard an awful explosion, gunfire. It went like a terrible explosion. Mrs. Wilson, how many explosions did you hear, please? Just one. Were you still seated and looking into the fire at that time? Yes, sir. Your back was turned to the front door, is that correct? Not right to the door, but my back was toward my husband sitting by the radio. So you were not looking in the direction of the front door? No, sir. What did you do upon hearing this explosion? Jumped up, opened the front door, turned on the porch light, and looked across. In front was an old field, and I looked out across there. Did you see anything at that time? No, sir. Did you see anybody? No, sir. Did you see any automobiles? No, sir. Where was the light that you had to turn on? The switch was right by the door. On the inside of the house, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, and that turned on the porch light? Yes, sir. When you did that and looked and saw nothing, did you go out onto the porch? I just stepped outside the door. I didn't see anybody. Okay, Mrs. Wilson. Then what did you do? I didn't see anybody. Then I turned around and saw what happened. When you turned around, where was Mr. Wilson? Lying on the floor. Where was the chair in which he had been seated? It was turned over on the floor. And at that time, did you observe any wounds on Mr. Wilson, anywhere on his body? I did. How many separate or distinct wounds did you observe? Just the one. Uh, Please, ma'am, describe that wound to the court and the jury, please. Well, it was the left side of his head that was torn off. That night, Bama said she saw Doyle Kaysen for the first time. It was in her home in the hours after the murder, and she saw him talking to Vinnie Davis, who lived several houses down from the Wilsons on Long Drive. She lived there with her parents and her younger brother, Curtis. Vini and her father were two of the first people to come running to the Wilsons' home after Lester was shot. He was still alive when they got there. Bama had one other distinct memory of Doyle Kaysen that night, besides him being in her house for the first time that she remembered. She also recalled that he had on high-top fishing boots that were unfastened, and they were also dry. The prosecution also began to establish what they viewed as the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office's role when it came to investigating Lester Wilson's murder. Bama testified that she knew Johnny P. Steele was the sheriff in Okaloosa County at the time of Lester's murder, that she'd never spoken with him that night or in subsequent years since or days since. To that end, she'd never spoken with an investigator or a deputy sheriff or anyone about the case. Not that night, not the next night, not in the weeks or months to come or even the years to come. There was one other interesting thing from Bama's testimony that I do need to mention. She said that later that night, a Dr. Hart came by her house and offered her a sedative to calm her down after her husband's murder, and she refused. Woodrow testified that he was 23 years old in 1940, and that he helped his father operate his taxi service, driving both days and nights depending on when his father could work. Woodrow told Hallows that Lester was going to run for sheriff in 1940, and that the night of the murder, he dropped Beanie Davis off at home on Long Drive, then his father, then headed back downtown to Crestview to pick up fares. Woodrow told the jury that late in the afternoon of March 15th, 1940, he'd seen William Dorsch Brown and the Kaysen brothers at the Sunray Cafe, which was adjacent to the taxi stand that he worked at. Woodrow also testified that Jesse Kaysen and Constable Joe Adams both had taxi services that they ran out of the same taxi stand as the Wilsons, right in the middle of Crestview. 
and that Adams, who died a few years before the trial started, was driving a black 1938 Ford at the time that had a spotlight and a radio on it. Also at the time, Woodrow said Doyle Casing drove a black 1934 Ford with red tires, Doris Brown drove a black 1937 Ford, and Jesse Casing drove a 1938 Chevy. One eyewitness, Curtis Davis, the younger brother of Vini Davis, would testify that he saw the vehicles belonging to Adams and Doyle Kaysen speeding away from Long Drive in the minutes after Lester was shot. Woodrow said that two or three hours after his father was shot, Sheriff Johnny P. Steele finally showed up with a couple of deputies in tow, and they'd been turned away by Woodrow and Fox Wilson, his uncle. He also said that he'd never spoken with investigators again in the case, not in 1940 or 1952 or any of the other years since. Woodrow told the jury that a couple of notable things happened when he returned from his father's funeral to the taxi stand about a week after the murder. One of those was that in his father's absence, and his absence, that Jesse Kaysen had taken over a bigger role in the taxi stand. He said, quote-unquote, that he'd kindly forced his way into being sort of a partner in the taxi stand now. The other thing that happened to Woodrow when he came back was that he was approached by two women. One of them said that she'd seen a car follow his the night of their murder, around the time right before his father was killed that she thought it was odd, and that she'd taken down the license plate number. This is from Woodrow's testimony. I checked the number. Tell us how you checked the number. I saw Mr. Brown's car. Uh, what Mr. Brown exactly, please? Doris Brown. Okay, William Doris Brown, the defendant in this case? Yes, sir. How did you know at the time it was his car? I saw him get out of it. It was the one he'd been driving all the time. I saw him get out of the car across the street from a taxi stand and went over and checked the tag number. Not surprisingly, the numbers matched up. Alma Wilson testified that when he came home, his father's body was already gone, but there was still, quote, blood and brains and skull and buckshot on the floor and in the corner by the ceiling. Alma also remembered seeing Doyle Kaysen in the Wilson house for the first time that night. He also remembered what Vini did and what his mother did about Doyle, that he was wearing high-top fishing boots and that they were dry and unlaced. You're listening to The Sheriff, a new podcast series from the Northwest Florida Daily News and the Gannett Company. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever else you might download your podcast from. Ray and Walter had spent the first few months of what was essentially the first real investigation into Lester's murder going over a lot of old material. And a lot of that was what Ray and his uncle Fox Wilson had discovered over the years. And we now know that Ray and his uncle Fox had determined pretty early on, from that time they knew that both the Kaysen brothers and William Doris Brown were definitely suspects in the murder, in their eyes at least. The problem was they were having a real hard time tracking down other than people that were directly connected to the family that could testify as to what they'd seen or heard around that time. But Woodrow Wilson did remember that there was a woman who came and told him about the license plate number. And he did remember that she'd been around the Sunray Cafe quite a bit, but he just couldn't remember her name. And that's where Walter came in. Somehow or another, Walter, digging in a town that he had no business digging in, came up with a name. And that name was Maddie Lee Beck and she was living in San Antonio. Ray and Walter hopped in a car and began the drive to Texas. In January of 1940, Maddie Lee Lucas was a 27-year-old widow living in Andalusia, Alabama with her parents. She received a surprise visit from a childhood family friend, Lucille Wilkinson, who now lived in Crestview. Lucille told Maddie Lee that she was renting part of a house in downtown Crestview, and if Maddie Lee wanted, she could get her a job at the shirt factory she worked at in town. Maddie Lee jumped at the opportunity to move on with her life and start a new chapter after her husband's death. In a lot of the newspaper articles that I read that mention Maddie Lee, there are several descriptions of how she looked. Some newspapers described her as pretty, uh, some described her as plain, some described her as buxom, and I really could care less of how she looked. It's insignificant to me. But there were two of her physical qualities or features that I should point out because I do figure into the trial. One of those was that she had red hair. And I only mention that because Thomas Beasley, one of the defense attorneys, refers to her as, quote unquote, that red-headed woman for most of the trial. The other feature of Maddie Lee's that came up in the trial was her teeth, that she had buck teeth, meaning that her two front teeth stood out pretty noticeably. It was a feature that made her pretty unforgettable to some people, actually. And I only mention it because it really did help people 18 years later you know, reaffirm that's who she was and that they remembered her for that in particular. After Maddie Lee moved to Crestview and moved in with Lucille, who died several years before the trial, she found herself in the middle of a thriving social scene. There was Juke Hill, which we've talked about before, and there's also the Sunray Cafe in downtown Crestview, which was located almost directly in front of the home she lived in with Lucille. The house was set up as kind of a duplex, 
with the back door serving as the entrance for Maddie and Lucille, next to where they shared a room and a bathroom, and the front entrance serving as the entrance for a small family who lived on the other side of the house. Within days of moving to town, she met the Kaysen brothers. Not long after that, she found herself in a sexual relationship with both men. Here's some testimony from the 1958 trial from Maddie Lee. Speaking of January 1940, did you know where the Sunray Cafe was located? Yes, sir. Right in front of our door. Almost. You mean the place where you lived? Yes, sir. Did you ever have dates with the Kaysen brothers? One of the Kaysen brothers, at least? With both of them, sir. Uh, With which one did you have more dates? Doyle. Do you know how long you had been here before you had a date with Doyle Kaysen? Something like a week. About a week. And do I understand you also had dates with Jesse? Yes, sir. I did, sir. Did you ever have a date with William Doris Brown? I don't know whether or not you would call it a date, but I was with him one time. All right, we'll we'll get back to that. When you speak of these dates with the Kaysons, did these occur in the evening or at night? Yes, sir. On those occasions, did you ever have sexual relations with either of the Kayson brothers? I have had sexual relations with both of them. On the occasion when you first came here in 1940? Yes, sir. Did you have sexual relations with one more than the other? Yes, sir. Which one? Doyle. It's worth mentioning that Jesse and Doyle Kaysen were both married at the time they were involved with Maddie Lee. Maddie Lee also made friends with the Wilsons during this time, although that friendship was on a much different level than it was with the Kaysons. The Wilsons, Woodrow and Lester mainly, would give her a lot of rides to see her friends around town and to bars when she wanted to go out and meet people. They also would pick her up occasionally and drive her to work. It was during an afternoon of day drinking at Mar Camp out on Juke Hill that she first heard the Kaysons mention Lester Wilson. Here's how she remembers that conversation from that day. How did you find out Lester Wilson was running for sheriff? I don't remember just who I did first hear talking about it, but I believe it was Lucille Wilkinson and Doyle Kaysen talking about it first. Okay, Maddie Lee, do you remember any particular conversation you had with Doyle Kaysen about Mr. Wilson's intended candidacy for sheriff? Yes, sir. I can recall one in particular at Mar Camp. This was a date in the afternoon. It was Laura Stiller, myself, Doyle Kaysen, and Jesse Kaysen. We were sitting at a table drinking beer. The statement was something to the effect of... Uh, I'm sorry, please indicate who's speaking. I believe it was Doyle Kaysen speaking, and this isn't a word I usually use, but... Just tell it exactly as it happened, okay? You're in a court of justice and you're under oath. Relate as well as you can remember everything which was said and the manner in which it was said. Well, he said that the election was not going the way that old man, and if I must say, the word that son of a bitch... Les Wilson thinks it will go. That was Doyle Kaysen who said that? Yes, sir. That wasn't the only time Maddie Lee heard the Kaysons talking about Lester Wilson's candidacy for sheriff. She testified that she'd heard them talking about it on, quote, numerous occasions. It was a statement that was essentially catnip for defense attorney Thomas Beasley, who quickly objected on the grounds that Maddie Lee needed to recall specific conversations and that if she referred to them vaguely, she needed to refer to them not at all. Judge Fleet sustained the objection just momentarily, Offering Maddie the chance to elaborate on what she was talking about, Beasley's gamble that Maddie Lee's memory wasn't very good backfired pretty quickly. Two weeks before Lester's murder on March 1st, Maddie Lee said she, Lucille Wilkinson, and several of their other girlfriends had Woodrow Wilson drive them to Mark Camp for what she called a stag night. That was where none of the girls took dates to the bar, and they went there just to drink and dance. So, while dancing with another man, Maddie Lee saw people begin to rush to the windows of Mark Camp overlooking the front of the bar, She rushed over to see what was going on, and she witnessed Doyle Kaysen getting beaten up badly by another man that she didn't recognize. Maddie Lee said that within seconds of her watching the fight, she saw a car pull up. It was Jesse Kaysen along with Doris Brown, and they hopped out and broke the fight up pretty quickly. She went to the bar to order another drink, but within minutes, Jesse was inside of the bar and grabbed her by the arm, roughly, and said it was Doyle that wanted her to come outside, so she went. Maddie Lee left the bar, went outside, and got in the car with the three men, who began driving to Niceville. Doyle was sitting in the back seat, and his nose was bleeding profusely. She wasn't sure really who started the conversation, but she knows that all three men were in agreement, and it picked up steam along the way. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but when guys that are friends get in a group, and they're all talking about something they agree on, the volume can kind of turn up a little bit. And the content of this conversation that night had the same refrain. Over and over, she heard the three men say at different times, That son of a bitch Lester Wilson isn't going to get that election. It's not going to go the way that son of a bitch thinks. Over and over again, all the way to Niceville. On March 15, 1940, Maddie Lee worked the day shift at the shirt factory, then came home to have dinner with Lucille Wilkinson. At 7 p.m., she made the short walk over to have beers at the Sunray Cafe, 
When she went to put some nickels in the jukebox, she noticed Jesse Kaysen and Doris Brown drinking beer together at a table. She joined them, and both Doris and Maddie Lee teased Jesse over wearing a large, obnoxious cowboy hat, which he didn't appreciate. At around the same time, she remembers the phone ringing at the Sunray, and Howard Grantham, who ran the cafe, yelling out, Woodrow! That wasn't unusual, because people called the Sunray a lot looking for taxis, and sometimes they wanted a specific driver. So Howard Grantham yelling out Woodrow's name to see if he was there was pretty normal. What wasn't normal that night, according to Maddie Lee's testimony, was the conversation that was beginning to take place at the table she was at with Jesse Kaysen and Doris Brown. That's when they began discussing, quote-unquote, doing the job that night and figuring out how they could lure Lester Wilson somewhere via a fake call for a ride in a taxi. It was the same tactic that many people suspected Murray MacArthur and Charlie Powell had used to lure Lester Wilson out the night of Murray MacArthur's death. Jesse and Doris discounted that plan pretty quickly, mainly because they knew, especially after Murray's death, that Lester Wilson was always packing guns with him. They needed to get him somewhere where he wasn't going to be armed. At approximately 7.30 p.m., Doyle rushed into the Sunray Cafe and sat down at the table with Jesse, Doris, and Maddie Lee. Boys, Doyle said, the plans have changed. We're doing the job tonight at the house. You've been listening to The Sheriff, a new podcast series from the Northwest Florida Daily News and the Gannett Company. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever else you might download your podcast from. Doyle told Matty Lee to get up and follow the men outside while they walked across the street to Doris Brown's 1937 Ford. Doyle shoved Matty Lee into the front seat, and right away she saw two shotguns. One was on the floor in the front seat that she accidentally stepped on, and one was propped up in the back seat. An argument quickly ensued between Jesse and Doyle over Matty Lee even being there in the first place. Matty Lee stuck her head out of the window and asked Doyle if it was okay if she just stayed at the Sunray. He nodded his head as a car engine cranked up down the street. It was Woodrow Wilson, Lester Wilson, and Beanie Davis in the Wilson's taxi, leaving downtown and headed home. Matty Lee got out of Doris's car and Doyle told her to stay at the Sunray and not leave until he got back. The three men got into the car and took off in the same direction as the Wilson's car, but with their lights off. In Maddie Lee's testimony, she said there was a game she liked to play that was very much in line with what people probably thought in the 1940s. There weren't a lot of cars in Crestview, so when she would see one that was doing some sort of crazy traffic violation, like an illegal U-turn or driving with their lights off or going way too fast, she'd always try to catch a license plate number, and then when she saw the person, would tease them and say, hey, I saw you going too fast, or I saw that illegal U-turn, and they'd be like, whatever, you didn't. And she'd say, oh, is your tag number, you know, blank? And she always usually got a laugh out of it. One thing I've wondered throughout all this is why Maddie Lee was so drawn to the Casins and why she would spend so much time with guys that were such losers. And this was the only really kind of even close to an answer that I got. And it really didn't satisfy much of my curiosity, to be honest with you. This is from her testimony with Hallows questioning her about why she would have gotten in the car with them after she saw the guns and after she knew that they might be up to no good. What did he do to make you get into the car with him? Doyle caught me by the hand and said, Come on, I want you to go with us. Doyle did? Yes, sir. And any time he said come, I went regardless. Maddie Lee walked across the street and back into the Sunray Cafe at approximately 7.45 p.m. Within minutes, Woodrow Wilson popped his head in and asked Maddie to tell anyone who asked for a taxi that he was working that night. Sometime shortly after 8 p.m., Fox Wilson rushed into the cafe looking for Woodrow and saying that his brother had been shot. Woodrow was in just a few minutes after that, and Maddie Lee and several people relayed to him what had happened, and he took off immediately. Maddie Lee began to panic. The conversation that she dismissed earlier as just boys will be boys, or guys just joking around to try and look tough to each other, now took on a very real consequence. She hurried home and wrote her mother a quick letter. As she was walking to the post office, she noticed a car circling in the distance. It was Doris Brown. When she exited the post office, the car pulled up and screeched to a halt in front of her. Maddie Lee tried to walk around the car and back home, and when Doris Brown got out of the car and told Maddie Lee to get in, she refused. Doris grabbed her and shoved her in the front seat. They drove a short distance and picked up Doyle, who was holding a small package, and they began making the 30 minute or so drive south to Niceville. It was a pretty rural area, and Maddie Lee said they didn't talk on the way. Somewhere along the way, Doris quickly pulled over and Doyle got out. Doris, who was married, then drove Maddie Lee further out into the wilderness, to a dead-end road, where she says he raped her. Or, as she put it in the trial transcript, that he just took what he wanted. I'll go ahead and call it what it was. Rape. <laughs>
As Doris drove Maddie Lee back toward the way they came, he told her she needed to keep her mouth shut about what had just happened, that she was just going to need to forget about everything that had happened that day and that night anyway. Then the car came to a sudden stop. Maddie Lee turned to face Doris with her back to the door in the front passenger seat. Within seconds, the door opened and someone reached in, grabbed Maddie Lee by her hair and yanked her out of the car, dragging her along the ground for a short distance before commencing to beat her with some type of small, hard, barbed object. Brown stayed in the car as Maddie Lee was beaten. I didn't see who it was because I was sitting with my back to the door. I was beaten with a scrub or a club of some kind. I know it had limbs on it because I can show you the scars on my body right now if you want to see them. How severely were you beaten? I was not unconscious, but it was just so bad that at that time I had rather have been dead. And you don't know who it was that snatched you out of the car and beat you? I don't, sir. You were beaten right there by the automobile? I was dragged a short piece. Maddie Lee, how long did this assault upon you take place? It wasn't but a few minutes, sir. I couldn't say just how many minutes, but there were several licks. Did the person that was beating you say anything? Yes, sir. What did they say? They told me what I knew of that night. I had better forget it, or that wasn't half of what I would get. After the beating, Doris dragged Maddie Lee back into the car. She was crying and asked him who beat her. He said he didn't know, and he suggested once again that she forget everything that she'd seen or experienced that night. She said she was bleeding from where the, quote, knots on the club had punctured her skin. And in 1958, she volunteered to show the court the scars. But Hallow said it wasn't necessary. Around 10 p.m., Brown dropped her off at home. Lucille helped Maddie Lee out of her clothes, into a bath, and into a nightgown. Around midnight, Doyle began beating on the window. Terrified he might wake the family at the other side of the house, they let him in. Doyle told Maddie Lee she needed to come with him, and she refused. He forced Maddie Lee to get dressed and told Lucille and Maddie Lee that if anyone asked, he'd been fishing that night. He was also drunk off whiskey. Doyle walked Maddie Lee away from the house and down a bit to a secluded area by the railroad tracks. Once there, Doyle forced her to have sex. They stayed there until 3 or 4 a.m. as Doyle continued to drink and rambled about, quote, killing and shooting. Maddie Lee was terrified, and every time she asked what he meant, he would tell her to just forget what he'd said. Then he'd start in on it again. Maddie Lee lived in Crestview until the fall of 1940. She's only alone again with Jesse Kaysen one more time, and she never saw Doris Brown again after that night. Well, one night, not too long after, I can't say how long, sir, I would say that it was in a matter of about three weeks or a month that I went one night with Jesse Kaysen to Niceville to carry a load of soldiers to Eglin Field down there. Uh, You went with him in his cab? Yes, sir. He also had liquor with him, so he drank a little. But coming back, he got pretty well drunk, or whatever you want to call it. We stopped and sat there a while, and he said some things that I really got so scared that if there had been any way to get out of there, I would have. He started about brains and blood and death, just silly talk, but it was scary. In other words, I was scared, and I was glad when I got back to Crestview. The last time Maddie Lee was alone with Doyle was that summer. He picked her up and drove her to a baseball field where they had sex in the car. Doyle was drinking whiskey and began rambling, again. This time about how bad he felt for Bama Wilson. Maddie Lee tried to press him on what he meant by that. Doyle said, The best thing you can do is forget about all that. If I was you, I would forget it. Then he just stopped and stared off into space. Then he said, I will never forget the look on Jesse's face when he came back from knocking on the door and firing the gun. That was when I began trying to get away from Crestview. And you did, didn't you? I left this town with 15 cents in my pocket. Maddie Lee went on to tell the jury that Doyle, who had been constantly broken in poverty before the murder, had seemed to come into some money after Lester Wilson was killed. Maddie Lee left town without telling anyone she was leaving. She went back to Andalusia and quickly met a man who was from Hot Springs, Arkansas with the last name of Taylor. She moved to Hot Springs with him and went by Maddie Lee Taylor for several years. In 1952, authorities tracked Maddie Lee to Hot Springs, where they served her with a subpoena to come and testify before a grand jury in Crestview the one that was put together by Alty MacArthur, who was the sheriff then. One of the things that the prosecution mentioned in their opening statements, and that would come under a lot of scrutiny during the trial, was that Maddie Lee, like a lot of other people, had not disclosed everything they knew about the case back in 1940 or 1952 with the second grand jury. We've gone over a lot of reasons why they weren't telling the whole truth about what they'd seen. Most of them out of fear, and Maddie Lee wasn't really different. Hallows actually made a point of addressing this while Maddie was on the stand, And she said that there were several reasons she hadn't given her full testimony in 1952. 
One was that she was still scared of the Kaysons and anyone that might be involved with them. Another reason she hadn't told her full story was that her husband at the time was an incredibly jealous man, and part of her testimony would be that she had sex with multiple men during her time living in Crestview. It was something that he was totally unaware of at the time, but that she would eventually have to tell him. Maddie Lee also added something that didn't make it to the record, or that the jury was supposed to disregard. And that was in 1952, when she did return to Crestview with her husband, that someone had shot at them while they were driving in their car. Farron Campbell and Thomas Beasley, the defense attorneys, both grilled Maddie Lee on the difference in her grand jury testimony in 1952 and her sworn statement to Walter Steinsick and Ray Wilson in 1957. Beasley's line of questioning was especially out of line, and he essentially accused Maddie Lee of being a prostitute. He asked her if she'd ever received money for quote-unquote upkeep or for any of the sexual relations she'd had with either Jesse or Doyle Kaysen. Maddie Lee responded in calm fashion, saying no, she hadn't received money, to which Beasley responded, quote, so it was all just free then, to which Maddie replied, quote, if you can consider just almost taking anything free, then yes. Maddie Lee was married to the man she married after she left Crestview in 1940 until 1956, when he committed suicide. It was the same year she married a man with the last name of Beck, and the couple moved to San Antonio. That's where she was ultimately tracked down by Walter Steinsick and Ray Wilson, and they convinced her to come back to Crestview to testify in the trial. There were some concerns that she'd come out of some sort of pressure, but Maddie Lee quickly shot this down. She said, quote, Something like this, you can only live with it for so long before it starts to eat you up. Maddie Lee's testimony was a hammer over the heads of the defense. She was pretty much the definition of a star witness. Several parts of her testimony, especially the parts about sex, caused such a buzz in the courthouse that Judge Fleet had to warn the assembled to keep quiet. To try and refute her testimony, Beasley even called several witnesses to testify to the fact that Maddie Lee no longer had buck teeth or red hair. At the trial, her hair was dyed blonde, and her teeth were now straight. And, throughout much of the trial, Beasley refused to even call her by her name. He simply referred to her as that red-headed woman, the one without any morals. Siblings Curtis Davis and Vini Davis both testified to what they'd seen that night. Vini saw the cars pulling onto Long Drive and seeing the lights from a car and slamming of a door as she ran to the Wilson's house, along with Doyle's veiled threat to her that night that it was better if she hadn't seen who was in the car after she said she'd been seconds away from seeing whoever had killed Lester. Curtis testified to walking home along the Laurel Hill Highway and seeing Constable Joe Adams' car, plus another car, speed by him going back toward Crestview and coming off Long Drive just minutes after the shooting. He also testified that he saw Doyle Kaysen's car fly across Laurel Hill Highway from Long Drive and going down a dirt road. Another witness, Martha Grace Helms, testified on behalf of the defense. Helms had been a friend with the Kaysons until she got married in 1938 and moved to Pensacola when she was 21 years old. She'd had kind of a chilling experience when she'd returned home one time in 1944 to see her father. That was when she met a friend at Mark Camp for lunch. There, she ran into Doyle Kaysen. Doyle asked Helms where she'd been for so long, and if she'd heard anything about Lester Wilson's murder. Yes, she told him. It was a terrible thing. Helms, playing off an instinct and a rumor she'd heard, quickly asked Doyle if it was worth it. She testified that Doyle looked at the ground and replied, according to Helms, when you have something like that on your mind, it just really wears you down. On cross-examination, Beasley grilled Helms on why she'd never told anyone the story before. Helms told the jury she hadn't felt safe relaying the story to anyone until Ray Wilson had been elected sheriff. And when he had, she'd sought him out and told him right away. Jean Spear, a woman who was dating Jesse Kaysen around the time after Lester's murder, told a similar story. That was of Doyle, drunk, at the Sunray Cafe, telling her he was just 15 feet away from Les Wilson when he was shot and that he'd seen a man jump off the porch afterward, run, and get into a waiting car. Now living in New Orleans, it was Woodrow Wilson and Ray who'd come to take her statement and ask her if she'd come to testify. Thanks for listening to The Sheriff, a new podcast series from the Gannett Company and the Northwest Florida Daily News. For more of our great content, go to nwfdailynews.com. The next witness to testify for the state was Marie Coker. Marie was employed by the Southeastern Telephone Company in Crestview in March of 1940 as chief operator. That meant she had three assistants that handled the switchboard. They received calls and directed them to their de destinations. It was all done manually. Marie worked for the telephone company in Crestview from 1937 to 1942. And in 1958, during the trial, she was a nurse in Dodson, Georgia, that came back to Crestview to testify. In 1937, when Marie began working at the telephone company, she recalled there were 39 phones in Crestview. By March 15, 1940, there were less than 100. She remembered this because one position board had 100 lines on it, 
and that still wasn't full. In the night of Lester Wilson's murder, Marie said she was working the switchboard. And between 7 and 8 p.m., she testified that she received a call from Doyle Kaysen at the Standard Service Station asking to be connected to the Sunray Cafe. Doyle was a frequent user of the phone line, so she recognized his voice immediately. When she picked the line back up, she heard Doyle asking someone who was driving the Wilson taxi, and the answer came back, Woodrow. Doyle said he would be to the Sunray Cafe in a few minutes. Callers wouldn't always have the number they wanted, so a lot of times they just used locations. In this case, Doyle said, quote, give me the Sunray Cafe. Within one hour of the murder, Marie testified that the switchboard was totally full and that it was causing a fizz, referring to the electric hum the lines made when they plugged them in and out. Not long after the murder, Marie testified that she had a pretty scary experience. It had to do with the Casins, and it was pretty similar to other ones we've heard about so far. This one happened when Jesse Kaysen came into the Southeastern Telephone Company to pay his bill. Marie said that as Jesse was paying his bill, he brought up the topic of Lester Wilson's murder. Marie quickly responded that she wanted it to be settled, and she hoped that they would find out who did it eventually. Then, she told him that she knew about the call from the Standard Service Station to the Sunray Cafe. She did not, however, say that she knew whose voice it was. At that point, though, it became clear that she really didn't need to. Marie testified that Jesse made it really clear that whatever she thought she knew about the call from the Standard Service Station to the Sunray Cafe, she'd be better off if she forgot about it. For most of the next two decades, that's exactly what she did, until Walter Steinsick and Ray Wilson came knocking on her door. The final witness in the state's case was Marjorie King. In 1943, Marjorie and her then-husband, Grover Sasser, were living next door to the Casins. Sometimes, Jesse's mom, Katie Jean Kaysen, would ask Marjorie to come over and help with chores around the house and pay her a little bit of money. At the time, Marjorie was also taking classes to become a nurse, which Mrs. Kaysen knew. And one day she came over and approached Marjorie and asked for some help that wasn't really to do with chores. She said that Jesse was, quote unquote, really sick and that he needed a nurse. And could she come over and see if she could help at all? After her divorce from Grover Sasser, which Thomas Beasley represented Grover in that case, she moved to L.A. and actually did become a nurse. So she went to see if she could help Jesse out. What Marjorie found when she went over there was that Jesse was going through pretty serious morphine and alcohol withdrawals. Marjorie helped keep fluids in Jesse for a few days and helped a lot with the laundry as he was sweating through sheets and blankets every day. At the trial, Marjorie testified that she was there pretty much all day, every day, for several days, helping take care of Jesse. One of those days, while Marjorie was folding blankets in the laundry room, which was adjacent to Jesse's bedroom, she heard Mrs. Casing greet several men who came into the kitchen. The men walked through the house and came into Jesse's room, where they shut the door behind him. Marjorie could see all three of them through a crack in the door and could hear what they were saying. They weren't aware that Marjorie was listening in on their conversation. Here's what she had to say in court testimony. So who was nearer to the bedroom? You or Mrs. Kaysen? Me. Uh, you were folding blankets? Folding blankets and eavesdropping. <laughs> okay. Uh, tell us what you heard in the conversation between Mr. Kaysen and three men. Well, they started by telling him he had had to go to the hospital and he was arguing about it. They said, Jesse, you have got to go. You have got to go to the hospital for a few days. You can't back out now. It's too late. You have told all over town that you killed Les Wilson, and we have to go take you down there. It won't be long, and you'll be back, and we'll be taking care of you. Did you hear the conversation between Mrs. Kaysen and her son, Jesse? Yes, sir. After that first conversation, I was listening really closely. I was ready to run home. So what conversation did you hear between Mrs. Kaysen, the mother, and Jesse Kaysen, her son? Well, she was a precious woman to her son, and she didn't want him to go. They argued. Jesse jumped out of bed with his underwear on and began to roar at her. They argued a little more because she didn't understand why he was leaving. He says, Mother, you still don't understand. I have told people I killed Les Wilson and I have got to go. Then she says, Well, did you? And then hesitated like she didn't know what to do. I was standing almost in the door in case something happened where he did something to her. Then she asked again, well, did you? And he fell down across the bed and put a pillow on his face and started crying. So now you might ask, who were the men that came in the room that day and told Jesse he had to go to the hospital? I'll let Marjorie King, as voiced by the great Tina Harbuck, tell you who it was. It was Johnny Steele, Mr. Enzer the Sheriff, and Mr. Joe Adams. on the next episode of The Sheriff. Uh, anyway, I told Doyle Les Wilson was shot and the children didn't know if he was dead. I said, do you hear about Mr. Wilson getting shot a while ago? Doyle said, what did you say? 
I straightened up and stepped to the window and said, somebody shot Mr. Wilson. I will say this, because it was my father's brother. Mm -hmm. My father did say to me one time, don't ever, if anybody ever says anything to you about, did your dad do it, tell him I was sitting in the city pharmacy with a bunch of friends in downtown Crestview when this happened. Wilson, Wilson murder. Well, that's what he's talking about. My husband's saying the Wilson murder. That's what you're talking about, correct, Les Wilson? Yes, yes, ma'am. There was constant threats. And I couldn't walk home from elementary school without a deputy following me home. That was that tense. I guess it makes, it sounds tense, it makes sense, I guess. He was had a lot of... So this is why I ended up in law enforcement. <laughs> and you know what my specialty was? What? Investigating corrupt law enforcement officers. <laughs> How interesting. <laughs> Ironic. Uh... The sheriff is recorded at the Northwest Florida Daily News in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. It's written and researched by Tony Adami and produced and edited by Nick Tomachek. Additional voice work in this episode was provided by Savannah Evanoff, Nathan Cobb, Aaron Franzik, Tina Harbuck, and Sam Grubinoff.